as an aquanaut. That was just, just an awesome experience, definitely once in a lifetime to be able to go spend nine days about uh, 60 feet below the, the surface in an underwater habitat. And we would do a, a full end-to-end -end mission scenario, simulating the moon or Mars. That's where we really got to put to the test, what is exploration of these planetary bodies going to look like? So when we have these, what we call aquanauts, living in this underwater habitat, we can simulate some of the conditions that the astronauts will experience. And we're actually able to have these aquanauts conduct EVAs or extravehicular activities, simply put spacewalks, outside of this habitat. So really being able to see that process from multiple different angles, I think will be really beneficial as we start to nail down exactly what that's gonna look like for Artemis. Artemis is taking humans for the first time to the moon's South Pole region. This area of the moon features some of the coldest temperatures in the solar system. Artemis astronauts will look for signs of frozen water and gather clues about the young solar system when the planets and moons were just forming. Flash forward to astronauts exploring the lunar surface with the Artemis program, you know, they're going to be doing exploration. They're going to be visiting a site on the moon that no human being has ever visited before. And they're going to be taking pictures and describing rocks that they see, you know, collecting samples, deploying instruments. And we want to, you know, have them experience all of these things here on Earth, of course, before they fly to the moon. NASA has been training astronauts in geology and geoscience for decades. These scientific fields help us understand the evolution of the physical and chemical makeup of planets and moons. From their deep interiors to their surfaces and atmospheres, Apollo astronauts had hundreds of hours of training in geology, or the equivalent of a master's degree, and Artemis astronauts will too. NASA's astronaut corps includes geologists like astronaut Jessica Watkins, Yes, so my job title is now astronaut, NASA astronaut. We all come into the astronaut office with you know, a, whole, a whole career in the, in the rear view mirror in a lot of senses. For me, the way that I ended up kind of sitting in this seat was by keeping it in the back of my mind. So I became interested in Mars at a pretty young age, actually. Um, I'm not sure, uh, somewhere around fifth grade. So this, is, this was in a defining time for my life. But I remember for some school project, you know, making a little a book about Marty the Martian. That love kind of carried through in college when I found geology because I learned that there's this thing called planetary geology. And the idea of being able to study the surface of another planet was just the coolest thing to me as somebody who, who loved Mars. Geology training on our home planet covers just one aspect of what it would be like to scientifically explore the moon. Lower gravity, extreme temperatures, and a bulky spacesuit make operating tools and collecting rocks a great challenge. NASA scientists and engineers work hard to design and build custom tools that will work well in the extreme environment of the moon's south polar region. Making any sort of hardware that flies in space is a huge team effort. I help to lead a team of people who are building moon tools. And so uh, specifically the tools that are going to take samples of the moon and bring them back to Earth so the scientists can study them for generations to come. At Johnson Space Center, we have what's called the Rock Yard, which is essentially kind of a you know large you know open space where we've imported <laughs> rocks, um, basically a large a human sized sandbox. It's great. At the Rock Yard, we get astronauts to come out to be test subjects, but we also get engineers and scientists and operators to be test subjects as well, so that we can fully understand what it's like to be in that crew perspective. So understanding, you know, what what our priorities are, what types of rocks we're interested in and why, but also to start using the tools that we'll be using to collect those samples. Let's just start with the most simple tool, the geology hammer. You, you all know what a hammer looks like, um, but in the South Pole, it's going to be really cold there. 
And so we need to make sure that we're using a material that doesn't break at very cold temperatures. So we create a test plan that includes putting it through environmental testing. So putting the tools in very hot conditions and very cold conditions and making sure they work. We can't just go to the hardware store and buy a hammer. We have to go make a special one. And then we have testing like ergonomic testing to make sure that it actually works with the astronauts and that it fits their gloved hand when they're in the spacesuit. It's not too exhausting for them. There's all of these little different nuances of being in the spacesuit that are hard to fully appreciate unless you get in there. As anyone who's worn a spacesuit will tell you, it feels like wearing a balloon that's constantly pushing down on you. Spacesuits have to meet many demands. They must be sturdy enough to keep astronauts safe in the low gravity and high radiation environment of the moon, but they also have to be nimble enough to allow astronauts to squeeze, poke, and pound their tools. It's tough to describe, honestly. It's large, it's you know about 300 pounds, I think. You're kind of operating your own personal spacecraft in a lot of ways. You know, the intent is for you to be able to manipulate your arms and legs in a, in a way that you would on the ground. So we have a large pool here um, at the NBL, the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory here on site. In, in the corner, we now have a moon area. So we've um, imported uh, sand and, and rocks down there, and we've started to do run trying to approximate one-sixth gravity. It's uh, kind of a lot of moving pieces, but it's, it's really fun. It's one of the coolest things we get to do. And I'll tell you what, some of my most favorite you know, moments at NASA have been when I see these engineers start to get excited about the science that we're doing and start to you know, learn some of the geology terminology, because that really is what creates an effective team. And so hearing, you know, tools engineer Adam Nade start to say, wow, this looks like a basalt that has lots of vesicles with olivine phenocris in it, just make me incredibly excited because it means that, you know, we're learning to speak each other's languages. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> I just like to do weird and unique things. So I've always found those, you know, those odd hobbies like learning to juggle or learning to beatbox or do improv. I was watching TV and I saw the TV show American Ninja Warrior and I was just like, I want to do that. And so I started to train to be a ninja warrior. That's how I decided that I should be called the Space Ninja. And so I would just share my interest of space. I got selected and got to go out there and compete. So I think we would limit ourselves if we only have one vision of what exploration looks like. Being a part of the NASA team has really showed me what that means and what exploration really looks like on a daily basis. But I do enjoy creative writing, short stories, um, poems sometimes. When I can you know, find the time, it's just a, an enjoyable way for me to explore what I'm thinking and feeling um, and really kind of you know, use the other side of my brain. Now, whenever I take a step back to like think about what I do, I mean, it is just, it is surreal and it is, it's just, it's thrilling and realize that I have a leadership role in this too. And I get to influence what we're going to do on the moon. For me, I think why it is so important for us as humans to explore is that exploration kind of forces us to push ourselves to the limits of our capacities. I think that's that's really important for us to do so that we can uh, you know find those boundaries and push them forward. You know, see what's out there, see what we're made of, see what the, the universe is made of and where we fit into it. The Moon's South Pole is an ideal location for many reasons. One reason is that we've collected more information about this region of the Moon than any other, from a NASA orbiter that's been circling the Moon for more than a decade. On the next episode of NASA Explorers, why the South Pole? What remaining questions do scientists have about the Moon and Solar System? And how will going to the South Pole help answer those questions? <laughs>